Hey everyone, this is Julie Caraccio. Welcome to another edition of Clearing the Clutter on the Inside and Out. I'm super excited. It's technically spring today here in Raleigh, although it's 35 degrees, and I'm guessing it's a lot colder where our guest is in Massachusetts, but we'll ask her that when we start talking to her. A little bit of te technical difficulties this morning, but you'll still get to see Susan's picture. You just don't, won't see a live feed, but hey, that's how it goes. You have to roll with it. So my Clearing the Clutter from the Inside and Out series, my goal is to tackle clutter from every single issue, issue physical, emotional, mental, all of it, with the goal that you can clear the clutter, because what is that? It's stuck, stagnant energy whether it's physical or mental because clutter is preventing you from living your best life possible so the goal here is for you to figure out where the clutter is and move forward in your life and share all of your wonderful gifts and today we're talking about closets it's spring cleaning time what a great subject because it's an area that we all struggle with so I'm going to tell you now about today's guest Susan Turkanian loves clutter simply for the joy of vanquishing it. After a long and varied career, she was called to be a professional organizer. Born and raised in central Massachusetts, she knows in New England thrift is as important as swift. Reuse Recycle is her approach to organizing professional and business processes and decluttering for businesses seeking maximum efficiency and effectiveness. Her compassion is for her clients and her service is lifting clutter from their shoulders and freeing them to produce to take pride literally to live. She receives joy from helping you declutter, from seeing you happier at work, happier after a more productive day, and happier to arrive home. She is a member of the National Professional Organizers. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Julie. Uh, just a comment on the weather? Yes, please. In Central Mass here, you can, I want you to feel bad for us up here. We're at 25 degrees with a real feel of 18. <sighs> ay, ay, ay. So you know, uh, even though even though it's that cold, it's still spring, and we rejoice at moving forward. Excellent, I'm with you on that. So let's get started. Closets seem to be an area where many people get stuck. I do professional organizing, yet I had my friend who was a stylist come over and help me with my clutter and help me get going on my closets. Why do you think we get stuck here? I think our closets can be one of the most stressful places in our in our house, and one of the th conclusions that I've come to is that it actually becomes a spot of accusation for us. It becomes a spot of saying you fail at something because you've got your fat clothes and your skinny clothes. You've got clothes that you haven't been able to let go of and you've got clothes that you just don't want to deal with. And so what I think happens is that there just becomes so much we can't deal with it and it's like you open the door and it's saying shoulda, woulda, coulda. Mm-hmm. And that way, it, it, it's create. You're starting your day on a negative tone. You're starting your day feeling like you've settled for something to wear, and maybe you don't feel your best going out the door. I think that's. I think that's so true. And you know, I'm struggling right now. We'll talk about this. Uh, you know, definitely. Uh, I married an Italian man. And I've gained weight because I've eaten more pasta in the past 18 months than I have in the, probably the past 20 years of my life. And so, you know, I, um, I have that going on in my closet. And yet, I'm like most people, I have a good fair amount of closet, clothes in my closet, yet some days it feels like I have nothing to wear. What do you think's going on there? I think that people beat themselves up because, again, of the shoulda, woulda, coulda. And one thing that happens is, you get so many choices in your closet that you it, it just becomes overwhelming and you pick out something that's too big and it's like oh I'm growing into that and I don't want to do that or you've got the this on the other end you've got the skinny clothes and said I used to fit in that how come I don't but that combined with just the visual choices and especially when we're, we're in a hurry trying to get out the door we want to we want to look great but then how do we how do we put something together? So I think I, I think that's part of the problem. But there's also what I found oh maybe six months ago is that there's a brain based reason for it. And I think when we can come to accept that there is something going on within our bodies that's telling us that we don't want to let go of something, that we need to be okay with that, to know that it's not all in our heads. Well, it is, but it's not what we think. We, it's not from what we think. 
It's not the woulda, shoulda, couldas, but there's actually a physical brain-based reason why we have a hard time letting go. And I want to talk about that moment, but you said something really interesting to me and I had an aha moment. You talked about going into our closets being overwhelmed. And I thought, wow, that's true. And I feel like days, and again, I, I don't have, I mean, because I do this for a living like you do, and I've seen a lot of closets. Comparatively, I don't have a lot. But there's still that sense of being overwhelmed. And I feel that sometimes when I go to the grocery store. I go into a grocery store, and I think, oh, my gosh, there are just too many things to choose from. And so that's a little aha moment for me because I don't know if I could have articulated feeling overwhelmed. Well, you know, that, that's an interesting point of the grocery store. And I know in our past conversation we talked about a movie from 30 years ago with Robin Williams called Moscow on the Hudson. Mm -hmm. And I would highly recommend that to anybody who wants to watch it. For one thing, Robin Williams is good. But for another thing, it really points out the difference between not having a lot and going into a grocery store and being overwhelmed. Now, in the beginning of the movie, he it started with the lines in Russia where they would go into a into a I guess I don't know if you call it a store or wherever they would obtain groceries or whatever, and it showed him getting a pair of shoes. Now, I don't know how accurate this portrays Russia back 30 years ago. But if you wore a size 8 and the only size pair of shoes that they had was a 7, you took it. And so mm -hmm. fast forward to when Robin Williams came in the movie to New York. He was part of the Russian orchestra that was with their circus touring in the States. And he defected. The scene that has always stuck in my mind is exactly what you were talking about, Julie, is that he was in the coffee aisle and he was looking at all those choices and he literally, and at least in the movie, passed out. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's in, in a small way, I think that can happen. That sense of overwhelm can happen even in our own home and in our own closets. And I think you know that as a, as an organizer. Why do you think it is though that closets tend to be a breeding ground for our past or our future? You know, I'm like, oh. I have, you know, the swimsuit that doesn't fit, and I know I'm not alone, or I know people who maybe have the t-shirts from high school, and it's not just one, it's several, but closets seem to attract that, less so than maybe like I'm sitting here in my office, and I'm like, really, everything's pretty much present moment. So why do you think that is? Peter Walsh says it so well, and you, you mentioned him earlier, about clutter is anything that keeps us from living our best life. And then he goes on to say, that it's not the stuff, it's our relationships to the stuff. And all these things, for instance, the high school t-shirts or the things from your past can evoke good memories. And we're afraid if we let go of those things that we're going to lose that memory, we're going to lose that experience. And that's one of the reasons I think that we tend to hang on to the other stuff. Now, on the on the, getting back to the fat clothes and the skinny clothes. It's the fat clothes that we hope we never grow into mm -hmm. and skinny clothes are the ones we hope we grow into. But I, it's like I always feel like I'm, when I'm looking at these I'm saying they're laughing at us. Then they're saying you're a failure. And right. If you haven't, it, you know, it's like the fat clothes are saying why don't you just have that bowl of ice cream and those three donuts that you really, really want, you know, we're here. Well, we'll, we'll you, you can be comfortable. And then the skinny clothes on the other end are saying, you were here once, but you're never going to make it back here again. But then you've got all those other, those other clothes in between, like the ones that you're talking about, the ones that we can't let go on, let go of because of the memories. I know a woman who's been divorced for maybe nine years still has her wedding dress. Wow. And sometimes it sometimes letting go of things like that it's that we're afraid of the unknown. We're afraid if we let go of that, some part of our past is going to cease to exist. And um I don't know if you're ready to talk about the brain based stuff yet. No, I was just gonna ask you, and that's the Yale study that you had told me about, correct? That's correct. Um I love Lifehacker because you find all these interesting things, but this is, for me as an organizer, has been the biggest gem that I've found. 
and there was a guy named Michael Cho who who published this and cited uh, cited a blog post on Psychology Today, and they Yale found in the brain that there there are two places the anterior cingulate cortex, and I can't remember the other one, but anyway, what happens is those centers register pain when we try to let go of things. For instance, if you've had a paper cut or a file folder cut, I'm sure. Yes. And those hurt very much. Or you've maybe taken a sip of a hot liquid and it, it burns your mouth. Or you get a brain freeze when you eat ice cream too quickly. Um, these are pain responses that our body goes through similarly when we try to let go of things. And the study actually took place at an auction. And they gave people at the auction mugs to hold. And they, they did, and then they took the mugs away at certain intervals. And they found that the people who held on to the mugs the longest paid up to 60% more than they would have had they not been holding on to that. And um, when I tried to make sense of this, I say, okay, how does this fit for everyday life? The example I can think of is that kid in the shopping cart that you're behind. Mm -hmm. Mama has given him or her something to hold on to to keep their hands from grabbing stuff off the shelf and adding things to the cart. And so maybe she intended to buy it, maybe she did not. But then she says, well, we've got to give this to the nice lady who's going, we have to pay for it. And what does the kid do, Julie? Screams. Is that fun? No. no. Sometimes, but most times, no. Okay, or you take two toddlers. They're playing nicely on a play date. One of them has a toy, and then the other one tries to grab it. What happens? World War Three. Exactly. And so what I'm thinking is, I said, okay, if there's a brain-based response for why we hang on to things, then think of it in terms of the kids. They can't rationalize, oh, I'm going to get this back, or oh, I want to share. They just don't have that capacity yet. And so what, what I'm seeing is their brain has made that attachment to that thing. Now, I think for each of us, it's a little different. And the interesting thing in this study is that he cited that the Apple Store wants you to pick up things and hold them. And they know from this kind of research that when you pick up something and you hold it, your body's making a connection with it. Maybe that explains my husband's obsession with Apple. That could be. That could be. But if you if think about it in terms of our clothes, and as I was thinking about closets and the whole thing, other than the bathroom in the house, that's the most intimate part of our of our home. You, you know, the clothes that we've worn. They've been in contact with our body. We may not be holding them in our hands, but that contact level is there. And so when we look at something, said, yes, it evokes the memory, but I think there's also that brain-based connection that's there that somehow we have to try to, to work through and get past in order to really begin to move forward. But that's a very powerful study. I didn't hear about that and until you told me about it and really that's really amazing if you think about it but you know we had Adam who made a comment you know nine years is a long time to hold on to a wedding dress after being divorced but why why do you think based on that study why would she hold on to that because there was a divorce I mean I'm sure there were happy times in the marriage but ultimately I would think the connection would be that's no longer there do you have any thoughts perhaps on or do you believe just based on this study that we're just so wired in a way that that it's just maybe more difficult. I think everybody is different, but this woman has kids, and so it may be, and I've not spoken with her about it, it may be that that wedding dress represents a connection to that part of her past that, that was happy. And, you know, for whatever reason, if she's still struggling with, with the divorce, even though it's been nine years, um, Letting that go means that she's really severing a past. And again, I don't know the circumstances surrounding the divorce. and So it could be a variety of reasons. But I think that um, 
I think there is wiring involved in all of this. Um, I'm curious. So I just want to. I have one comment, and then I have another question. I did a little show on living in the present moment. Uh -huh. because I think that what that woman is experiencing, and there's of course no judgment here. So many of us are living in the past or in the future, and we're not embracing the present moment and being there. And I, I, I absolutely get that. So uh, I, I understand that. Why do you think it is? Or for based on the study, after knowing that, did they offer, I don't know, I know for instance emotional freedom technique which is tapping, which is all about rewiring uh, for people who have suffered uh, post-traumatic stress disorder use this. So did they offer any guidance on how to unwire? I don't know if that's possible. No, not from what I read, Julie. And I, and I need to go back and reread actually the whole study because, of course, in Life Hacker and things like that, you don't get the whole thing. Right. And but, I just thought of that, though, if they, you know, probably not if they were focusing on that. But, but that adds, an old, adds another layer. And then you can easily understand why our closets are such an emotional uh, breeding ground. You're touching, it's, everything's there, and then you, that constant connection. I think in some things we need to mourn some of the things that we're trying to let go of because it's like that letting go process, whatever technique that you use, if you don't make a conscious effort to do it, as I'm sure you know, and I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of people listening will know, if that consciousness is not made on that level to let go, then you're going to experience pain. You're going to experience the pain that that center in the brain says, no, you're not letting go. So, and a lot of times is bridging that gap between knowing that you want to let go of, needing, you need to let go of something, knowing that you want to, and actually being able to do it. And so I think that's where, you know, that's where I've been making connections of my own in the, in, in the closet. And um, it, when you can come to that of actually being able to let go, the first few times it might be hard, but then once you've made that and once you've practiced good decision making, then it becomes a little easier. And I think the, the interior clutter starts letting go so you can let go of the exterior clutter. I agree with you 100%, and I'm so thrilled that you mentioned, you know, it is hard at the beginning, but it's like anything. If you build that muscle, if you do it a few times, it's going to get much easier. So people think that's a great tip to people to know, like, even if it's challenging, just stick with it because it'll become easier. So when you're working with someone, what do you say to them to help assist them um, when they're really challenged and letting go of items in their closet? That is a very good question because each person is so different. Um, but I, I go through the traditional, you know, when's the last time you've worn it? You know, does it fit? Does it feel good? Does it make you look good? And then if they can't decide right then and there, I say, okay, put it aside. We're going to come back to it. And then we find the pieces that are the easier ones for them to let go of and just say it's okay to not have to make the decision right now. You don't have to conquer your cl closet in one fell swoop. Absolutely. I think it's important for people to give that permission to themselves and and not start off with something that's really difficult but just know okay I can have make that decision to deal with it not now. Now I can't do that all the time obviously but right. Um, I'd like. Can we jump back for a minute? Because I sure, absolutely. I found something very interesting. A friend of mine, who I had met through Weight Watchers, and we became friends. So, for anybody, I know you can't really see me. You know, I know what I know what the weight challenges are, and I know what the fat clothes and the skinny clothes mean. I've experienced that myself. She said that it used to take her about 20 minutes in the morning, every day, to figure out what to wear that she didn't make her depressed because she'd always gravitate towards the skinny clothes hoping that sometime during the night the weight loss fairy had sprinkled that magic dust that um, you know she could fit into them again 
And so if she started to have any weight gain for whatever reason and she gravitated towards her fat clothes, that made her feel bad about herself. So I, did, I, I crunched some numbers just for the heck of it because if we think about how much time we spend during the day trying to figure out what to wear, and it may not be all at once. It may be you have to change your clothes at some point for an event or whatever, but you're still having to spend time deciding. On the basis of 20 minutes a day for seven days a week, that's 140 minutes a week that you're spending deciding what to wear. And then if you break that down into an hour, that's two hours and 20 minutes a week that you're spending standing in front of the closet or trying things on, trying to find what to wear. That's nuts if you think about it. I love that you've broken it down that way. Wow. Over the course of a year, that's 7,280 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Which amounts to 121.3 hours per year, which amounts to 5.05 hours, 5.05 days per year. Think about it, that you're standing in front of your closet trying to figure out, what am I going to wear? And how many people say, oh, I need more time in my day. I wish I had more time in my day. And there you found one thing that's very common that I'm sure a lot of us do. And, and when you really realize the amount of time, wow. Yeah, and over 10 years, if, you take, if you're on this particular figure, you spend 1.66 months in 10 years standing in front of your closet or trying to find something to wear. Now, where would you like to spend a month, Julie? Oh gosh, Tahiti, at a spa, on Italy, anywhere but in my closet. That that blew my mind when I when I looked at that. And it, it's it, when you look at it in terms of what it cost you in terms of time, I think it takes on a whole different perspective of motivation. It's like I want to get this down so that I can I can I can live the life that I want to live. But I think what really key is, because I want to talk about physical organization in a moment, but I've always found, and please share your experience, is it seems to be more effective when you can deal with the underlying issue and to be able to move forward and things can go quickly as opposed to just tackling the outside of the problem. Now, I am a firm believer that if you work on the outside, then it's going to help with the inside as well because if you letting go clutter, whatever's going on inside will show itself. But, but I would think that this kind of, you know, my preference would be to do the inner work because I think that once you do that, everything on the outer tends to go faster. Do you have any thoughts on that? I couldn't agree with you more. And I think sometimes they end up being side by side. That when you start giving, when you start helping people experience the freedom of a cluttered exterior, you know, that lets some of the stuff come through to the surface. And so then maybe they can deal with, they, ha they have the room in their life to be able to deal with the interior. But sometimes as you go along, it's like you get to somebody who will break into tears because of an emotional attachment to something or the memory that it, that it evokes. And you just have to kind of, I found, let that, let that happen and let them be in the moment. Absolutely. But could you, you had mentioned a couple before, but I just maybe thought we could, could get a moment here where maybe some questions that people, when they're going through their closet, what they could ask themselves that would help them let stuff go. Sure. One of the first things that I have people do is I'll have them ask, does it fit? So that either it, that can, that's a yes or no answer, right? Then the second one is, do I like it? And sometimes we have, and I have done this myself, bought things out of desperation because I needed something that fit, but there wasn't a whole lot of choice, so I settled for something. Mm -hmm. And do I really like this? Does it really make me feel good? No. Um, so again. Does it fit? Do I like it? Does it look good? Because sometimes what we buy and what we think looks good really doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you know, I worked with a woman who was in her 30s but insisted buying clothes in the junior department. She was very thin, but the styles just did not fit her age. 
And um, you know, so again, we think something that might look good on us really doesn't. And I think the important thing is, do I feel really good in it? Mm-hmm. And I can let me share a little story about one of my friends um, who I was helping with with closet with her closet, and she came to the realization she was saving those things that we all save for best, and she would buy things maybe on sale, the, the buy one, get one. Mm -hmm. She didn't love them, and she didn't real feel real good in them. She finally came to the realization those weren't a bargain at all, that you know, wearing the, spending a few extra bucks on what makes you feel really good. Now she, I have to add on that, She's she is a stay-at-home mom with four kids under the age of nine. Wow! And she found that even mentally making that shift from wearing sweats and those kinds of things that we would think about wearing at home to be comfortable, she shifted into her the clothes that she would wear as a physical therapist, like a pair of chinos, maybe a polo, and mentally it made a huge difference in how she approached her day and how she. Um, approached, I don't want to say organizing her kids, but being able to carry through without feeling frustrated. Excellent. I think that's a great point because there are a lot of, you know, stay-at-home moms or moms that work from home and and I think how you dress absolutely dictates your day and kind of it gets your, your attitude and how you're going to move forward. I think that's important too to remember for people who have at-home offices that if you decide that you're going to wear sweats and a and a t-shirt and work all day, and of course there are some things that require that if you're if you're getting down and dirty and organizing and cleaning, but if you if you're trying to be productive, if you're trying to maintain some kind of an office decorum, dress the part even in even in your own home because how you dress is going to make a difference in how you feel about yourself, how you approach your day, and your productivity. Absolutely. Now, can we switch gears a little bit? And can you give us so if we? I think we spent the first about half hour talking about letting go of the emotional clutter. But I want to give people tips on organizing their closets once they've they've let go, and how can they organize it to make their day easier? The first thing I would say is that whatever kinds of clothes that you wear most often, for instance, if you have if you have a set of clothes that you're required to wear for work, say scrubs, put those to the closest to the front so that you're not having to dig through on a daily basis. And of course there's the whole thing about putting your picking your clothes out the night before. That's a whole other thing. But as far as organizing your closet, put likes with likes. Some pe people like to put all their long sleeve shirts together, all their short sleeve shirts together. Some people like to organize by color, like blues, reds, whatever. And I think what works for you is the most important. But be cons try, to, try to keep the likes with the likes. If you have things that you only wear for special occasions like that little black dress for women or that tux for men, maybe it doesn't need to be in the closet that you use every day. Um, want to try to limit the, the visual choices that you have to work with on a daily basis. Another thing I would say is clean out all those extra hangers from in between your clothes because there's nothing worse than trying to do this and struggle because you, they just get tangled up in one, one another. So, and um, you know, I think that's, that's the way I would start with people. I have a couple questions. One, do you, is there a hanger? Have you seen the slim hangers? Do you have any thoughts on those? The, the one thing uh, that I've noticed, and if you look in any of the print ads or online, any of the closet companies will have the exact same kind of hanger. I don't think it matters what kind of hanger. I like the slim lines because they do have a narrower profile and they do they do look better. But if you have all white plastic hangers and that's what you prefer, that's fine. But I found that having the consistency of the same kind of hanger 
decreases that amount of visual clutter that you have to go through. And I experienced that in my own closet. Because I changed over from plastic hangers. And when you buy plastic hangers at one of the big box stores, you go back for the same kind that you find that you like. They may not have exactly the same kind that you like. And so you get something that's close. But I had blue, I had tan, and I had white. And I didn't realize that was giving me um, a visual stimulus that I didn't want to work through. So when I switched over to having the exact same kind of hanger in my closet, I stopped seeing the hangers and I started seeing my clothes. Oh wow, that's really interesting. That's a good tip. And I want to talk a little bit about, this just came into my head as you were talking, about perfectionism. Because I think sometimes people can get hung up in that. And I once actually went out and dated a man for a couple dates and after I saw his closet, I knew it was a great, great match. No, but wait till you hear it. You're just opposite. It wasn't a slob. His closet was the most organized closet I'd ever seen, and it scared me. It was one of those times when the the um, hangers were the same width apart. It was just too too uptight for me, and I thought, you know what, I could I couldn't maintain that. I'd probably hide a shirt incorrectly and would be on stressed out on pins and needles, but you know, and again, what works for people is what's most important, but I think a downfall sometimes is we get so caught up and everything has to be right, everything has to be perfect, and, and so talk a little bit about that. Perfectionism can undermine us very easily, as, as you very well put. Um, and so when you're thinking about organizing or or closets or whatever, if you aim for what you can feel comfortable with that and be okay with that and know that at times life is going to happen life is going to throw you curveballs that you're not living the way you want and that's when the overwhelm starts feeling and so it's a matter of I think stepping back taking a breath just allow our bodies to settle and to, and, and to be okay with where we are at the moment. I like so much what you said about living in the moment because if we live in the past we're I don't want to say doomed but we're we program ourselves to repeat it and if we live in the future we never experience those wonderful things that the present has for us. Well said, well said. So do you have any special tips maybe creating our closets to be more happy because it's usually a place of frustration and emotional overwhelm. So any tips on that? Sure. Uh, one of the first things I would do that I suggest is that if you cannot part with your say I'm going back I'm going to go back to the weight thing with the fat clothes and the skinny clothes because I think a lot of us experience that. So if you really can't part with those Box them up, even as you come upon them. But what you need to do then is put them in another room. Get them out of the closet that you are, that you're working in routinely. Because if they're not in front of you, they can't accuse you. And when there's distance between you and those things that make you feel bad, they have less of an impact. I used to say just get rid of them but some people aren't ready to do that yet and that's okay oh and I have to tell you one, one of the stories that my friend with the four kids told me is that she came to the realization that those you know those ugly sweaters that you get from aunt so-and-so or mm -hmm. from you know it's like when you're a kid and your mother said you have to wear that because your grandmother made it, made it for you or your grandmother gave it to you and when you went to school, all the kids laughed at you. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, Julie. Uh, Luckily, no. But you, 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 I'm sure it's happened to kids. Or you've got that. I, that must be where the ugly Christmas sweater came from. The people got these uh, these really gaudy, awful sweaters that somebody gave them, and or they made them. And it's like if they got rid of them, oh my God, the ghost of Sarah would come back and haunt them and make them feel bad and make them feel guilty. And my friend Karen said, 
I've come to the conclusion that when we get something we really don't like, our obligation stops with being accepting it graciously. Doesn't mean we have to keep it forever. Absolutely, absolutely. So I th I think that's an important thing too to remember is that when people are overloading us with stuff that we don't really like, then we need to remember that it's okay to let go of it as long as. If, if we re-gift, we just have to make sure it's in a different circle of friends or relatives that the other person is not going to see that we uh, that we got rid of it. Yeah, because you know what? There's someone out there who might love it. Exactly. It would exactly. bring joy to them. So I love that, and I love that, that that was an aha moment for your client. So I want to talk a little bit about um, My Wardrobe Genie, which is something you created. So tell us about the process, because what's so great is, you know, today we're talking about the inner and outer worlds of clutter and and so your system that you develop tackles both of them. So tell us about that. Exactly. Um, originally when when I developed this it was because one of my clients who had been helping actually long distance got to her closet and said okay now what do I do? So I gave her the usual reverse hanger method where you hang all your clothes backwards and so all the hangers are, fa are facing the opposite of what you would normally do and then when you wear something you turn it forwards and she said to me oh no that won't work for me I have to hang all of my long sleeve blue shirts together all of my short sleeve blue shirts together and I think you get the picture so it's someone who has been super organized for a very long time she lives near a store that gets buyouts lots of clothing it like at the end of sales uh, and so that she can get a say a Calvin Klein skirt for five bucks and so you know for her that's not that's not a huge investment but what it did is it crowded her closet so she just really couldn't find much of anything and so after she said the reverse hanger method wouldn't work for her I sat in my in my cloth office and I said oh crap now what am I gonna do and then as as I just looked at my own my own closet rod. I got the pictured in my mind creating zones, physical zones that would define boundaries for us. And so the first thing I thought of was we, we, we need a zone to define what we're wearing, what we're not wearing. And um, then I said, well, what if we had one to corral all our empty hangers? Then we can see how many we have. When we see how many we have, we can say, I don't need 30 empty hangers. So that in itself, by calling out some of the things that we really don't need that are easy, creates more space. And then I said, well, what about ironing? So I created another zone for that. And then someone who tested the product said, well, what about something for mending and alterations? So now I've got these physical placards that actually hang on your closet rod and everything starts on what I call the discerning side and the when I developed this and started seeing the process come come forth I knew the language had to be something that would be supportive and that would be encouraging for people to be able to make decisions and so rather than saying the I don't know what to do with this side and I gotta I gotta throw it out or I gotta give it away that's where that's where the the process came in comes in and so everything starts on the discerning side of the hanger then as you wear something you go through it and you ask yourself those four questions or three questions that I had mentioned first of all does it fit and if it doesn't fit what am I going to do with it and so you either going to donate it or discard it and I thought well you know People need some kind of a, a some kind of a a process or some kind of a a way to talk through this with themselves because the wardrobe genie is actually meant that you can do this on your own. So here's what I came up with when I uh, if I, if they were going to make the decision to discard. This is how I have people let go, even of other stuff. You have served me well, thank you. Now it's time for you to retire. I like that. It, so it's it, it 
yeah, you you get you you you're letting go of it. But if you think of retirement, it's like when we retire from work, we don't throw ourselves away. And then on the donate side, I said we yeah they they know in their head that they're giving it to someone and it's going to help somebody else. But there needed to be something to bridge that gap. And so the process here is I have enjoyed you, but somebody else needs you now. Take good care of them. And so that way you're, you're getting in your mind, yes, this was important to me, but you can help somebody else now. So vicariously you're helping to take care of someone else. Which is wonderful. I mean, I've always found that I feel better. I sometimes think I get more joy out of giving than the recipient does because it makes me so happy. You're, you're absolutely right. And so in, in the wardrobe genie, you get to work through your closet one piece at a time. You don't have to pile everything on your bed. I don't know if you've ever done that, Julie. You take everything out of the closet and say, I'm going to conquer my closet today once and for all. Pile everything on the bed say, I'm going to go through this stuff. You get about six things done and then um, you say, oh, i gotta, I got to go do something else. I've got to, oh, the phone rings. So you get distracted. You come back six hours later to go to bed and the clothes are still on the bed. I don't know if you've ever done that or if anybody else has ever done that, but you know, some people end up sleeping on the couch because the stuff is still on the bed and they don't want to deal with it. And so that's the whole thing. with The, the wardrobe genie provides that physical support of helping you define what you're wearing, what you're not. And what I found by using it myself is that when I hung it in my closet, I could see exactly once more what I had. I've forgotten, oh, that blouse I have that I bought on such and such that I settled for, but I really haven't worn and I don't like. It is still hanging there. But by providing a, a, a boundary and a separation, it helps to take that, um, it, it's almost like having, I don't want to call it a divorce, but it, it, it takes away that attachment that you've had to that item. You find what you're wearing, what you like, and then you're Choosing time for getting dressed the next day is just cut down phenomenally because you've got a zone of clothes that fit you right now, that you like, that make you feel good right now, that you can choose from. For instance, you know, oh, I think I'll wear my black slacks and my blue sweater tomorrow. And you go from 20 minutes of angst of, not try of trying to decide or trying to put together an outfit to maybe two or three. Oh, that's great. And I think, you know, sometimes people don't want someone in their home, even if it's someone that's a professional organizer. So that's a nice option for them. And at the same time, it helps build their muscles and cluttering and getting organized. Right. I was going to say, this is the decision-making process because you're allowing yourself to have to focus on one decision at a time. Excellent. Now, before I want to... Uh, is there anything you've given us a lot of great information today, but anything that you forgot that you want to make sure that you share with us? I think the one thing that I would encourage people to do is to resolve that today is a new day. That today, today I can do one thing. And if it means something in your house, I can pick up that one newspaper and deal with that. I can, I can, and then what I would encourage people to do is when you do that, when you are successful, take a moment to pat yourself on the back and say, I did it. Even if there's nobody else in the house, say it out loud. I did that. I can do, I can do this one thing at a time. I think that's wonderful. So if they're overwhelmed and because you've given us a lot of great information today, that's one thing that they can do to move forward. That's right. Fantastic. Now tell us, website, Wardrobe Genie, how does someone get that? Any upcoming classes? All that good stuff that you want to share. Well, right now, um, and I hate to use this term, but the Wardrobe Genie is base based in a 
crowdfunding campaign, but I've actually shifted from the crowdfunding mentality to wanting people to take advantage of the prices and the packages that are available because we're in the spring and this is the time where we start thinking about changing our clothes over. Well, at least you may be down there in North Carolina, but we're still here in winter clothes. Um, but it's a good time to start with something like the wardrobe genie because you're starting with a clean start. And the, the best way to access that right now is through my website, which is allsetsolutions.com. And that's all set one word, and all set solutions is one word, dot com. Um, if, Julie, if I could honestly give one of these things to every single person in this country who would like one, I would do that. If I had Donald Trump's money, I would do that. Because it makes making the decisions and making having having that intimate area of your life not causing you angst but causing you pleasure translate in, translates into so many other areas of your life that you know you you got your closet organized well you know what I feel so good about that maybe maybe I should try tackling my desk and that's that's what happened with another friend of mine who tried the product her her closet was in her office and when she started feeling good about her clothes and being able to access what she needed and making use of the things that really made her feel good she started seeing how she wanted that feeling in other parts of her home and so I think whether you work by yourself or you work with an organizer and certainly I'm not trying to put any organizers out of business either I think it, it, it's a good it's a good tool to help people move forward and um, to develop the systems. You can also find me on Facebook at All Set Solutions. I share stuff there and I just started blogging. And some of the things that we talked about today as far as the mind body connection, that's really that that's really a, an important piece of my whole organizing philosophy. And so I try to bring in things that I find, people that I found that that support these kinds of things to help make the mind shift because if we don't make a mind shift we can organize all we want but it's never going to be it's never going to be that interior organizing that really makes the difference in how we live our life yeah it's an outstanding point and I couldn't have said it better and I just want to say about Susan I've uh, one of the pluses of social media is that's kind of how we met and I've gotten to know her then I was like oh let's talk and I'd like to interview you and talk about stuff but She's being authentic when she says if she could give everything to everyone, uh, a wardrobe genie should do that. It's just she's that comes from her heart, and that's the type of people that I want to promote here on Clearing the Clutter from the Inside Out because I want to connect you with people who are, who are passionate about what they're doing, who truly want to help you, and, and she is someone that, that is coming from the heart. Thank you, Julie. I think that's why I feel really good that we have connected on social media. And as tough as it can be sometimes, those are the real the plus times for me. Absolutely. Well, Susan, I want to thank you for your time today. And everyone, thanks for checking us out. And when we have the recording, we will put, um, uh, we will put it up. So you'll have, we'll have a website for Susan if you didn't catch that. We've got a wonderful comment here from Adam. Love it, Susan. You've got to make that a mind shift. So that's fantastic. All right, everyone. We will see you here next time on Clearing the Clutter from the Inside Out. And if you go to reawakenyourbrilliance.com, you can find out all upcoming shows. Or if you follow me on YouTube, you will be able to, at Cybert Radio, you'll be able to find out any upcoming Google Hangout. All right, go out there and clear the clutter, everyone. We'll see you here next time. Bye now.